Good morning, this is uh, Deepak Chopra. I'm still in California. This morning I'm traveling to Edmonton in Canada where I'll be speaking about the future of well-being. And uh, I shall be leaving shortly, so I decided to do uh, this uh, podcast on uh, our continuing series on discovering your cosmic self dot com and today's question um, that has been asked is is the quantum world linked to everyday life in science the subtle quantum world of possibilities is theoretically separated from the fixed world we perceive by the so-called Heisenberg cut why is it important to unify the two dimensions? So that's the question that has been asked. <clears throat> and it has been asked because uh, this discussion is now live on our forum, which is discoveringyourcosmicself.com. So please uh, join us at this website, discoveringyourcosmicself.com. Okay, so before I answer the question, what I'm going to do actually is to read a little bit from the book and then answer your question. Okay, so the a little bit from the book is actually uh, very important, so I'm going to read that. And it's from the chapter, Is the Quantum World Linked to Everyday Life? There is no doubt that quanta are part of the everyday world. When plants convert sunlight into chemical energy, a quantum, the photon, is being processed. Quantum activity is also thought to enable birds to navigate on long migrations by following the Earth's magnetic field. Processing electromagnetism in the bird's nervous system would be a quantum effect. Even so, the division between quantum behavior and the ordinary things we experience is crucial in physics. A specific name, the Heisenberg cut, was given to the dividing line that separates quantum events from our perception. Heisenberg himself didn't propose the name. It was bestowed later in his honor, but his thinking repeatedly, repeatedly indicated that there was a theoretical line dividing how quantum systems behaved in their own right as waves and how they behaved when observed by human observers. He was speaking mathematically. The wave function is one of the chief features of quantum mechanics, but as we've pointed out several times, this elegant construct has never actually been seen in nature. It has been inferred. The Heisenberg cut is useful not so much to divide the real world, but to divide the kind of mathematics that works on one side of the line or the other. It's like a border where only French is spoken on one side and only English on the other. Even this begs the question of whether quantum reality is um, uh, really isolated and separate from everyday life or everyday reality. Perhaps quanta are making things happen all around us that we don't notice. Or maybe the whole picture has been turned upside down. Quantum behavior could be the norm in the everyday world, and we only happen to discover it first in the microscopic world of waves and particles. Not every theory of the universe requires the Heisenberg cut. The multiverse doesn't, for example. But without a doubt, the quantum lies at the horizon of our senses. We cannot visualize quanta. We cannot visualize quanta. And now the dark matter and energy must be confronted. We may have reached the limits of what we can think about. What lies beyond the horizon is both everything and nothing. It is everything because the virtual quantum domain contains the potential for every event that has occurred or ever will. It is nothing because matter, energy, time, space, 
and we ourselves originate somewhere that's inconceivable. It becomes quite mysterious to reconcile the duality of everything and nothing in order to describe how creation operates. Okay, so that's a little bit from the book. Now let's talk about the question. Okay, so right now you're looking at me, and you're looking at that beautiful painting by a great uh, Indian artist. Um, and uh, what's coming at you right now from your device, from your computer, or from your handheld device, are quanta, photons. But you're not experiencing photons, you're experiencing me, my sound, the sound of my voice, that painting, and whatever else is around you. Look around you, and all of it is photons coming to your eyes and sending electrical signals to your brain, but you're not experiencing the electrical signals, nor are you experiencing photons. You're experiencing the sound of my voice, and you're experiencing the image that you see, that you call Deepak, you're experiencing that painting behind me, and you're experiencing everything around you, uh, and including your own body. And right now we're only talking about seeing, but also hearing. The common factor in all of these is an electrical signal called an action potential that's going to your brain. So is there a link between this quantum world and everyday life? Obviously there is, right? Uh, you are uh, experiencing what we call now this perception, this sound, this vision, this image. But um, uh, what is actually happening is at a level of uh, the quantum. So there's a link, right? What is that link? How does that happen? This is a very difficult problem that science is struggling with. Okay, but let's look at the basic elements of uh, uh, the quantum world. First of all, in the quantum world, there is something called superposition, which means everything exists potential all at the same time. So in that quantum world, um, everything exists as potential at the same time. That's called superposition, space-time, energy, information, and matter all coexist. So that's the first characteristic of the quantum world. The second characteristic of the quantum world is something called quantum leaps. So particle moves from one location to another location without going through the space in between. If you've seen Star Trek, it's when the captain says, beam me up, Scotty. Scotty presses a button. And then uh, immediately, um, uh, you know, the captain is transported from planet Earth to some location in space-time. Okay, so that's also called teleportation. That's the second characteristic of the quantum world. The third characteristic of the quantum world is non-locality. Non-locality means every event in space-time is correlated with every other event in space-time. If you tickle the universe in one location, uh, it can laugh in another location. Distant, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, or trillions of miles away, um, instantly. Tickle the universe here, it laughs somewhere in different space-time, in distant space-time. Because distance in space is also distance in time, that also means that past, present, and future are instantly correlated in the quantum world. So that's the third characteristic. The, well, third, fourth, whatever, I don't know. The next characteristic of the quantum world is unpredictability, or what is called the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which means that uh, uh, a fundamental at fundamental levels of reality, uh, space uh, and time are correlated, but also at fundamental levels of reality, waves and particles are um, 
complementarity, but you cannot uh, uh, discern a wave and a particle at the same time. So you can one either know the location of a particle or you can know its momentum um, at one time. But until you do the experiment, both wave and particle exist simultaneously. So again, a few, um, few reminders from the book that I just want to give you bullet points. Uh, and from the book, You Are the Universe, Discovering a Cosmic Self, uh, uh, Discovering a Cosmic Self and Why It Matters. So here are a few pointers. Remember, a photon can't be seen in flight and is only known at the moment of detection. Actually, quantum phenomena are neither waves nor particles, but are intrinsically undefined until the moment they are measured. This is um, um, from the book. And in a sense, the British uh, philosopher Barclay, Bishop Barclay was right when he asserted two centuries ago, to be is to be perceived. To be is to be perceived. To be is to be perceived. At least that's how you know that something is going on, that, that something that exists. John Wheeler similarly said, we live in a participatory universe. The observer is woven into the very fabric of reality. Suddenly, the human universe doesn't seem either far-fetched or far away. So, as conscious beings, we are embedded in the reality we perceive and experience and also explain, which is what we're doing right now. Okay, and then reality, of course, is species-specific. Change the nervous system and light will change with it. An owl's acute night vision, the ability of an eagle to spot a mouse from hundreds of feet in the air, the underwater sight of dolphins, a bat's ability to see using echolocation, all of these examples are radically different from human sight. Okay, so billions of stars and galaxies are totally invisible until a nervous system turns them into the experience of, of uh, uh, stars, which are luminous. Okay, so we are now beginning to see that even though the world is quantum, we do not experience it as such. Now, there used to be a time when people said that uh, that um, you know, the, the physics of the quantum world is different from the physics of the classical world. Uh, that is, to some extent, true. The Einstein's theory of gravitation does not um, reconcile itself with uh, the quantum mechanical theories of electromagnetism, strong and weak interactions. So there's a problem, right? Uh, the three fundamental forces of nature, um, electromagnetism, which is responsible now for this experience you're having as you're listening to this podcast and watching me, and then the strong interaction, the strong force, which is responsible for holding the atom together. All the protons are squeezed uh, together um, because of the strong uh, force, and then the weak uh, interaction, which is responsible for radioactive decay. These three forces explain everything that's happening in the microscopic world, but they do not explain gravity, which is a distortion of space-time um, and uh, a curvature of space-time. And so that uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, and the quantum theory, they do not reconcile with each other. And that's the problem in coming up with what we call a grand unified field theory. Okay, so we do not have a grand unified field theory 
at the moment, science is trying to solve that, address that. But reality must be one, right? Um, if the macroscopic world and the microscopic world uh, cannot be reconciled, they're still part of what we call reality. They're still part of what we call reality. And so, in order to explain reality, we have to be able to explain experience. So, let's get to the bottom of this, okay? You, as a being, you as a being, the one who's listening to me right now, the one who's seeing this image, the one who's hearing the sound, at fundamental levels of reality, you, you yourself are a field of infinite possibilities. You are in superposition. Uh, that means that uh, before a thought arises, before an emotion arises, before a feeling arises, before a perception arises, before a sensation arises, all there is, is all possibilities. Everything, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, exist in superposition. So experience exists in superposition, number one. Number two, at that fundamental level of being, everything in your body is being correlated. Um, so, you know, there are trillions of things happening in your body. Uh, your body itself contains a hundred trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So, um, um, a human body can think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins, and make a baby all at once. What is correlating that? Your own inner being is correlating your body. In fact, just to listen to my con conversation with you, right now your brain has to compute many things, different parts of your brain, in a way non-locally connect with each other. And this is called binding, so that you can actually have the experience of seeing me, hearing me, thinking about what I'm saying all at the same time, a form of non-local correlation. At this level also, because you live in the realm of possibility, there is unpredictability. If I asked you, uh, can you predict what thoughts you're going to have uh, tomorrow at this time? Can you predict the thought that you're going to have? You can't, right? At this uh, realm, you are living in unpredictability. What we call <clears throat> the known is predicted, it's already happened. So the experience that you're having right now, it's already happened. So that, of course, we know what it is. But the unknown, where we live and breathe and move, is always in the realm of unpredictability, which is very good, because um, without unpredictability, there would be no creativity, and creativity is the essence of who we are. So now looking at your consciousness, it's a field of all possibilities. It's a field of non-local correlation. It's a field of unpredictability. And also it's a field of creativity. Creativity is there because of the unpredictability. This level also, there is intention, which actually uh, takes possibilities into actuality. So, in fact, we are enmeshed in the quantum world as beings. We take quantum leaps of creativity as well. Okay, so just like there are quantum leaps in the quantum world, uh, our creative process is a quantum leap uh, where we move from one context, meaning, set of relationships, and uh, stories to a new level of meaning, context, relationship, and story. So, we are enmeshed in the quantum world, and that's our fundamental nature. But actually, if you go even beyond that, then we are essentially um, enmeshed in the world where the whole universe arises from in the same way as sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, and perceptions. <clears throat> so at this level, 
body, mind, and universe are inseparable. So is the quantum world linked to everyday life? Most certainly, yes. In science, the subtle world of possibilities theoretically separated from the fixed world we perceive by the so-called Heisenberg cut. Well, the world that we perceive appears fixed in this moment, but in the next moment, uh, it won't be the same. So there's nothing fixed about the world that we perceive. People, of course, say there are laws of nature, and these laws of nature, of course, are, as Rupert Sheldrake would say, habits of nature, and even perceptual reality subject to revision. So there's nothing fixed about the physical world. It's only fixed upon perception. In the same way, a particle is fixed upon measurement. Okay, so I think um, I've answered the question. Why is it important to unify the two dimensions? The reason it's important to unify the two dimensions is that reality is one. Any split of reality into quantum and classical is artificial. And why does this insight help us? It helps us because we realize that we ourselves are the field of infinite possibilities. We ourselves live in the realm of unpredictability and creativity. We ourselves have the choices uh, available to us through intention to create the reality that we want to experience. We ourselves are the participants and co-creators of that which we call the universe. In other words, we ourselves are the universe. You are the universe. Okay, so join us for a conversation on discovering your cosmic self and dot com and also, this uh, conversation will be available for discussion on our website, which is uh, um, that site that I mentioned, but also on YouTube. If you go to the Jio channel, jio.com, the t-shirt I'm wearing is um, basically um, a, a website or what we call an app or soon to be the most important internet of well-being. Okay, so have I answered uh, the question satisfactorily? Only you can tell me, okay? So I'm just looking at any other questions you may have, and then I will wrap up until I speak to you tomorrow. We need to order those t-shirts. You can get them on jio.com at the Jio Marketplace. Elizabeth just bought meditation for stress release and anxiety. Thank you. But a lot of meditations are available free as well on jio.com. Okay, so I'm just still looking. Let's work on figuring out the theory together, unified aloha theory. Jessica, theories are human constructs, reality is what we experience and the consciousness in which we experience them. What is Jio again? Matt Mansfield asked. Jio is the internet of well-being. You can download the app free of charge by going to jio.com. Uh, Laurie has uh, posted the URL from TechCrunch, which talks about jail.com. So you can, if you go to the conversation there, you'll find it. What would be the first book of yours someone should start reading? The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. But this current book is very important. It's my most important book to date. You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self and Why It Matters, co-written with uh, Menas Kapatos, quantum physicist and cosmologist. Okay, I think uh, for now we have covered a lot. This conversation, this podcast has been going on for 25 minutes, so I'll stop uh, so you don't get uh, tired.
tired or bored of this conversation. Thank you. Have a good day and speak to you tomorrow.